Good evening and welcome to another edition of Film Nut. I'm your host, Jeff Schubert. Well, before we get to our guest tonight, I want to say, give a quick shout out to all of our syndicates, Blog TV, Ustream, StickM, and our new one, Yahoo Live. We appreciate you watching wherever you're watching and welcome to Film Nut. Well, our guest tonight, well, before I get to him, I just want to say before he was the governor, he was the Terminator. And there's a good chance if Arnold Schwarzenegger was in a movie, my guest tonight was his makeup artist. He did 19 movies with Arnold Schwarzenegger, another seven currently that are starring Dwayne Rock Johnson. His credits include all the Terminator movies, The Sixth Day, Gridiron, Be Cool, Doom, Game Plan, too many to mention. We're very excited to have him on. He is a third generation makeup artist and his name is Jeff Don. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you for coming in tonight. Glad to be here. So third generation, that means your father and your grandfather, or mother and grandmother, or what's the combination? My grandfather, Jack Dawn, started off in um, 1935 running the makeup department at MGM Studios, and uh, he was there till 1950. And then my father got into it, my uncle got into it, now I've been into it for in, 27 years. It's in the genes. Well, I think we have an instant message right off the bat that I want to get to because seeing that you've, as you've been in the business and your family has been for so long, uh, we have an instant messenger who wants to know how has the makeup industry changed over the years? It's changed a great deal. Of course, at my grandfather's day, you were lucky just not to kill the actor because you would use products from the paint industry right. and from other areas that, that uh, you everybody's probably always heard the story of Buddy Epson, who was the original Tin Woodsman. And he had to go to the hospital due to ingesting um, dust from um, aluminum. That's wow. what they were using to make him look like the aluminum man. Excuse me, you know, let's put you in the hospital. It could kill you, but we'll get somebody else to replace you, and we'll use something different on him. So modern-day actors have nothing to complain about with their makeup artists because yeah. they're not killing them, right? We, we, we come close to we killing close them. To we come close, but they're paid a lot, so, you know, we can come <laughs> close to killing them. <laughs> That's funny. So that was question was asked by the Gillinator, by the way. So we, we get that, and we like that name. The Gillinator. The Gillinator. I like the Gillinator. It's a good name. So now, what about the airbrush? How new or how old is that? Airbrush has been used for many years. Usually, in the, in the past, it's been used for special effects. If you want veins, you want to create creatures, cover bodies with things. In the last few years, it's been used more and more for beauty makeup. And uh, it's being used quite a bit right now for both special effects and beauty, but there's a concern because of the airborne products that you're putting into a small makeup trailer. So maybe the, uh, the safety people will come along and say, sorry, you can't do that soon. Right. Now, are there people, like I think we were talking beforehand, you said you don't use it that much, you use it a, li a little bit? I do, I use it a little bit. I use it for straight makeup. I use it quite a bit to cover up tattoos and bruises and to do special effects makeup. There, nothing can beat an airbrush to cover up a large tattoo then uh, you know, if you're doing it with a brush or with your hand, it takes forever, it doesn't look good. Right, but, so there's, but it sounds like there's still a combination of manual and airbrush. Absolutely, most of the work we do in the makeup industry is still done manually with brushes and sponges. Okay, we have another IM, uh, Jeff, and all these are directed to this Jeff, not this one. <laughs> you probably worked on at least 10 Schwarzenegger movies. I said 19 in the intro, is that mm -hmm. correct? That's okay. correct. Uh, which Arnold makeup effect were you most proud of um, to have pulled off and why? The Arnold fans. The the Arnold fans. Well, to the Arnold fans, and I'm very familiar with them, um, the the Terminator movies were, were very interesting to do. I worked alongside uh, Stan Winston, who was the makeup designer and the creator of the actual appliances and makeup effects. Now, you won the Oscar for the second one, right? That's correct. Stan okay. Winston and myself won for uh, Best Makeup in uh, 1991 for Terminator 2. Okay. And... Um, um, you know, all of the Terminator movies are, 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 are challenging because you're using different materials each time. You're dealing with different needs. And, uh, I mean, I've had to put beards on Arnold. I've put tattoos on him. I've covered him in mud in Predator, which uh, he did not like whatsoever. <laughs> and um, so it's all been challenging. And the scope of the film sometimes are very big, and I have large crews, and I'm having to deal with, with that aspect, too. Well, now, speaking of changes, right, over, over the course of time, from Terminator 1 to Terminator 3... What were some of the biggest differences in terms of, let's say, the size of your department, the tools that you use, and so forth? Good question. Well, in 1983, when we did Terminator 1, it was done for a little over $6 million. And at the time, it was a decent-sized, non-union, low-budget film. Well, nowadays, when we did Terminator 3, it was, I think, 170 or $180 million. So we had the technology, we had the money. An example of Terminator 1, we did what was called low tech back in those days. There's a scene when Arnold is sitting on the table and he has his arm that he's actuating. Well, instead of having a very expensive animatronic hand, it was a, a sleeve, it was a glove. 
and there was a puppeteer under the table that slid their hand through a hole in the table and into this glove that was sitting on the table. So as Arnold would do this, that puppeteer could move it. Mm -hmm. Very low tech, but incredibly realistic. So you did something for a few thousand dollars that would cost nowadays hundreds of thousands of dollars. Right, wow. Now, speaking of effects and CGI and all that stuff that's come into play, how involved are you in uh, previs, as my visual effects guest would call it, previsualization? Mm -hmm. And what's makeup and what's effects, and is that determined during previs and, and pre-production and all that? Yes, the meetings are set up ahead of time between all the different departments that, that can be affected by this. And there's so much green screen work being done now, so much being created in post-production. And then there's a crossover between makeup and, and visual effects. An example is in Terminator 3, when Arnold's face was blown apart from one side over, it was makeup. The area from here past that was a void or it was area that was completely void of skin and only had the under under structure that was green screen we we literally painted his face green there so later on visually they could go in there and replace it with a skull that was smaller than we could create with makeup piling it on top so half his face makeup half his face literally painted green literally painted green with a line of demarcation right or as james cameron would say the line of Terminator. Right. One day he came to me and said, Jeff, you know what the word Terminator means, don't you? And I'm like, uh, this movie? He said, no, that's the line between day and night on the planet. It's called the Terminator. I'm like, I'll never forget that. <laughs> <laughs> I think we have some stills you brought of, Great. of Arnold Schwarzenegger, right? I think we also have some of The Rock, too. But um, let's take a look at some of those Schwarzenegger ones. Fantastic. I have uh, one right here. Cool. I, think, I don't know if this is double or this is him. Th this is a double. This is an example, and there are some other photos coming up of uh -huh. this person who already kind of looks like Arnold. Right. And I have had to create myself and my team dozens, literally dozens of different photo and stunt doubles for Arnold throughout the years right. because many of the things that Arnold's doubles do right. are um, dangerous to, to life and limb. And Arnold does a lot of his stunts, or did do a lot of his stunts, but there are many that he didn't. Right. So we would have photo doubles. This is an example for Terminator 3 of a gentleman who had facial prosthetics on, including the nose and uh, the cheeks and the, the chin and the mouth, to look like him. This is the real thing yeah. right here, which Arnold's, uh, 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 his, his profile is so recognizable that it was fairly easy to create that with prosthetics on right. doubles. Now, before we came on also, you were talking, what's that one right there? Yes, that's a uh, burn makeup um, from Terminator 3. Okay. You were talking about that actors actually have makeup doubles, like not stunt doubles, but literal makeup doubles. Absolutely. Uh, when you're talking about an actor that gets 10, 15, 20 million dollars, their time, their comfort is at a premium. And I, there's a credit that I always extract from an actor when it comes to chair time and discomfort. And if they know that the credit is still in their favor, then I can say, hey, Arnold, can you come in here? I need to do a makeup for you or whatever. It's like, Jeff, this is going to take two hours. What are you doing? Do you need to do this, you idiot? <laughs> and <laughs> after, after 19 movies, you ought to be able to pull off a decent governor, you, right? You should see what I can get on the radio when I'm on a film. Uh -huh. I want the sandwich now. <laughs> <laughs> and you get it, huh? Yeah. Wow, Arnold, look at that. <laughs> so you extract a, a credit in, in a way. So when there's makeup to be tested for the director and for myself and for the actor, it's nice to get a double. You bring them in. Sometimes it might require putting a prosthetic on a person that looks like Arnold before adding all the other prosthetics that tear his face apart. Now what's more, more important in a makeup double, that he look like the actor or that his skin type be like the actor? Well, for a double, the, the order of it is the overall cutout. If you were to see a black cutout of the actor, his height, his size, his proportions, that's the most important thing. That make, uh, hair comes into play, then as you get in tighter, uh, facial structure comes into play. So there are many different departments like wardrobe and hair and makeup that, that are brought into this. Okay, we got a lot of I am, so I wanna get to another one or two here. Uh, Jeff, would you and Stan Winston come back to work on T4 if you were both asked? And what do you think of the makeup effects by Rob Hall in Terminator, the Sarah, Con Sarah Connor Chronicles? That was by Randy. Well, first off, Randy, I've watched the Sarah Connor, Sarah Connor Chronicles a couple of times, and it's a very well-done film. The makeup effects are fantastic in it. It's easy for me to 
sit back and go, oh, that's television. But the truth of the matter is it looks fantastic. It's entertaining. The state-of-the-art makeup is being provided, and I am very proud that you're working on it, and I give a big thumbs up to you. When it comes to Terminator 4, Stan Winston and his group is on Terminator 4. He will be doing the Terminator effects. I was asked to do it. The, luckily, the Stan Winston boys said, you got to get Jeff Dawn to do this. I, it was wonderful until I had to say no. Ooh. Unfortunately, I've committed to a movie, a Bruce Willis movie mm -hmm. called Surrogates, mm -hmm. directed by Jonathan Mostow that we're going to start in a few weeks. Yeah. And um, it's a wonderful futuristic film, and I committed to that, so I had to say no to Terminator 4. That yeah. was a tough one. Yeah, well, my heart bleeds for you. I have to turn down the Terminator <laughs> thing because Bruce Willis has me booked, you know? Yeah. You know you're doing okay at that point. I, I guess know? so. Yeah. That's good. Congratulations. Thank you. Uh, Craig Lee has a question for you. How did you get your training? Did you start out uh, taking theatrical makeup in college, or did you learn by experience? I was raised, of course, in a makeup family. Mm -hmm. I was, uh, from the time I was five years old, I smelled all of the different plasters and alginates and clays and all these different materials. And I'd go in there and I'd help my dad and I'd clean things up and such. So I was always around that. And my father actually hired me many times when I was a teenager to help out in the lab creating various makeup effects. But I never considered doing that. Mm -hmm. and, and he was t saying, oh, my son's going to go off and be a pilot or whatever. I finally decided I want to be a makeup artist with or without his help, and he was very supportive, unconditionally supportive of me, and he trained me. Mm -hmm. So that's how I got my training. I was very fortunate. We get a lot of filmmakers in here, and there's a lot of differing opinions on film school or not film mm -hmm. school to be a director. When it comes to makeup, is it can you learn it on the job by being an intern and learning from people like yourself? Do you recommend school, both? To someone I, new starting out who might Absolutely. Be Whether it's makeup, and I also can speak for the filmmakers mm -hmm. also, because my son is the fourth generation filmmaker in our family. Patrick, I hope you're watching. Patrick Don, <laughs> yes. And he's going to Chapman University studying film there. And he is uh, proficient in makeup, but he wants to get into directing and editing and all of that, too. So I've heard all of the different film festival people talking about, do you go to school or don't you? And whether it's makeup or it's becoming a director, everyone says the same thing. One day on the set is more experience than you'll gain in quite a bit of time in a, in a school. That said, every single one of them says, as I do, go to school. Whether it's to, go to, to, to learn how to make film or learn how to become a makeup artist. Find a good makeup school. You may not use more than 5% of what they teach you after a few years, but it gets you started. It puts you on the first rung of the ladder. What I like is, is um, for some people, it's very necessary. Maybe for others, it's not. It creates discipline. You know, you're doing it. You're, Absolutely. You know, you're doing what you want to do. If you're a filmmaker, cinematographer, whatever, mm -hmm. you're, you're working on film after film mm -hmm. after film. Mm -hmm. Instead of talking about doing it, you're actually doing it. So that's what I like about it. Now, a minute ago, you were, someone asked you, and you said you liked the makeup in the Sarah, in the Sarah yes. Connor Chronicles, right? The CC mm -hmm. thing. When do you see bad makeup in a film? And I'm not going to ask you to name any specific project, but like, ha do you go to movies and you say, wow, who's doing the makeup in this? Absolutely. And, um, it, and I give people the benefit of the doubt because I know myself it could be directorial decisions. A, a director can say, oh, you know what, I know we filmed with that part on this side of the head or the cut on this side of the head for the last four weeks, but I really want it on the other side of the face. So many times the director will do that. There have been many examples in films where suddenly the makeup flips and if we're filming a scene and they put it together and they realize the screen direction is different instead of me talking to you like this they want me talking to you like this they can literally flip the negative over they can take the film and flip it well what does that do to the parts and the, and the continuity it completely right. changes it so i give people the benefit of the doubt because i've been there myself but there is always that screw-up factor, and believe me, we're taking down names. Well, we have a script supervisor <laughs> coming in next week, so I'll have to ask uh, her about that continuity, right? Absolutely, because the, the script supervisor is ultimately responsible for that, but right. there's so many things the script supervisor has to keep an eye on that. Right, yeah. and the director, Crazy. as you know. So let's get to another one. Uh, Shiitake has a question. I want to ask if Jeff has ever used his, uh, used his uh, makeup abilities to prank someone. Um, yes, as as a makeup artist, it's very tempting to do this, but you have to be careful because the, the you know the, the boy that cried wolf. Right. Um, I've done that many many times. Um, I was working on an aircraft carrier on a movie called uh, Flight of the Intruder, and these GIs and, and, and Navy personnel would come in and they'd want to get made up just to play around, and they would walk around the the, the ship and people would be 
uh, uh, son, come, come with me, come with me. You know, so you got to be careful. I mean, we're talking about the U.S. military right, right, here, right. you know, but <laughs> there's been many times that I've been able to do that, and it's childishly fun. Right. <laughs> uh, Tom Horn Bourne would like to ask, uh, what adapts to what? The makeup to the lighting or the lighting to the makeup? Excellent question. And I, I want to th- add to that if it's okay, Tom Horn Bourne, because it, it matches with something I was going to ask you. In addition to lighting, all di- different cameras from film to digital how much do you have to factor that in when you're doing your job absolutely this is a long answer so I'll try to keep it as short as possible when it comes to the lighting we're constantly adapting to lighting and vice versa if I know that there's gonna be a red light on the set I know that blood is gonna look black I know if they're gonna be washing it out with some desaturation a lot of the colors are gonna deaden so we have to experiment in pre-production with the different types of light, whether we do it with still photos or preferably we do it with the 35 millimeter or digital to try to second guess it. A movie like um, Sweeney Todd, the makeups on them uh, to the eye would have looked very garish, very uh, theatrical. But once they washed it all out, it all became very realistic. And when it comes to uh, the, the cameras nowadays, the industry is turning into a digital industry. It is happening right before our eyes. and my son, who's very interested in cinematography, of course, the old school is 35 millimeter. That's the, the, the holy grail of cinematography. Cinematographers, I just finished working with Conrad Hall Jr., and his next film is going to be digital. <laughs> well, if Conrad Hall Jr. can go to digital, the rest of the world is going to be going there. And digital is, is going to be fantastic. It's getting there now, and it is rapidly going to be the best thing out there because you can make it look like film. You can shoot something ultra, ultra crisp and sharp that's too crisp and sharp for our eyes. You don't want to see the pimples and the pores and, and all of these things on the face in a close-up. But then you can correct that. You can tone it down in post. Absolutely. Yes. So I want to talk about the director for a second, your relationship with him or her on a, on a set. So you get the script. You break it down. How much of the look is determined by you and how much is it determined by your collaboration with the director or maybe wardrobe or hair? How does that work? There are several people that are involved in the look when it comes to an actor. Mm-hmm. Wardrobe, um, even the, uh, the, the um, uh, production designer sometimes will have people doing concepts, the makeup people, the, the hairdresser. Um, and Will the production we, designer ever come into your trailer and be like, no, that's that's not right. Um, you know, it's it's they have respect not to do that. Right. Typically, they may have a concept that they've created through their artists in meetings that have gone on for months before I've ever even been involved with the film. Um, it might be a Star Trek movie. It might be Aliens. It might be whatever. And uh, there's a concept. And usually, I, as a makeup artist and the hairdresser, are very aware of that long in advance, so that we're going down the the right the right road. But it, it's many meetings with the director. The director ultimately has the final say on everything. And you know, someone like James Cameron may come walking over after you've done all the blood and just go, there, let's roll. Right. You know, <laughs> And it's like whether it needed it or not, right. he has the right to do that. Very good. <laughs> Pool Man has a question. He would like to know, what was the impact of makeup artists during the writer, writer strike? We never hear the details on this sort of thing. The, uh, the television industry was hit in a big way. And I remember calling my union, the makeup artist and hairstylist union, who represent literally 1,500 makeup and hair people in Southern California. And they told me that they were down by about 30 or 40 percent unemployment. So that, to me, represents the television industry. Right. So it did hit everybody pretty hard for three and a half months. Yeah, no, definitely. Um, We like to be the indie film show that cares. Mm -hmm. So for independent filmmakers who maybe don't have a a very big budget, like really like a next to nothing budget, (laughs) what are some makeup basics that they can do just to, you know, help with things like shine and and that sort of thing that, that won't cost them a lot of money that they might not think of? Absolutely. Well, of course, get a makeup artist. You don't, if you have a low budget film, you can search in areas of people that are looking to learn. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, people that are just getting out of school that do have the capability of throwing together inexpensive, inexpensive blood gags and doing things low tech and taking care of your sweaty, shiny actors and and doing this for for a dime. I mean, it's a, for the experience. I did this for free mm-hmm. for several years when I first got in the business. Although I was third generation, I thought, oh, I'm going to be making the big bucks right. soon. Right. I spent five years 
looking for work and trying to get in the union. And I did many things that were for free for the American Film Institute and uh, the various colleges and UCLA. And, you know, if you're, whether you're in another city or in another country, you can go to the local colleges, you can go to the local theaters, and you can volunteer and gain that experience there and then help somebody someday, you know, get the, get the makeup on the screen for, for a dime. And what is your union? Um, it's 706 Local, Local 706 Makeup Artists and Hairstylists. Okay, so hairstylists and makeup have the same union for, for TV and film. Yep. And how hard is it to join? Um, it, it's quite difficult. There are several different ways to do it. Uh, a star request, mm -hmm. of course, is one, but that's difficult in itself. You have to prove that you've worked with a star on multiple projects, that they're, it's not just a, you know the hairdresser that, that is down at the local salon, that uh, there's a long history there and that they will benefit and fight for you if they don't get you. Um, union, non-union shows oftentimes, uh, majority of time these days, get unionized. People start off as a non-union film and then the union comes in and says, who wants to be union? Who wants to make the money and such? And these shows are aware that that will probably happen. So they oftentimes have a little extra slush fund so that when it does go union, it doesn't break the bank. Okay. Let's talk about the different types of conditions that you work under. What effect does working in, in water. I, I think you have a Deep Blue Sea, right? That's one of your credits. Deep Blue Sea okay. and, uh, you know, with the, all these action films, you're always in the ocean or in a river or in the, you know, in the rain someplace. So, so you are dealing with and water. and or perspiration, right? Yes. H how does that affect you? And let's say extreme heat if you're working in the desert or something. Sure. Well, extreme heat and perspiration go hand in hand. There you go. Yeah. And um, <laughs> that it, it, perspiration is the killer of makeup artists and hairdressers, both alike. There are products that you can put underneath appliances and uh, special effects that reduce or retard somebody's um, uh, sweating. Products called uh, like a sweat stop that will keep them from sweating in that area. Is that the literal name of a product? Sweat that stop. Sweat stop. Yes. Okay. Sweat stop. And these things retard. It doesn't completely stop. Right. But it retards it. And yeah. so you, you can, don't want to close off all the pores completely. Exactly. Right? Yeah. Well, yeah. Why is that person on the floor? <laughs> right. you know, exactly. In the fetal position. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. uh, I don't know. I'm going to lunch. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yes. Wasn't your grandfather the one who sent Buddy Epson to the yeah, hospital? Right. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> So um, heat is, is, a, is a killer for us. Of course, if it's a movie where you're in the jungle and they're supposed to be sweaty and all that, that's great. But if you, they have prosthetics on, and those prosthetics, some prosthetics that look the best are the most fragile. They're made out of gelatin material and such that break down with heat. So you have to be very careful. I don't like shows that deal with heat. When it comes to water, there are many products that are waterproof. You can make bloods that are plastic. There are makeups that are very durable that last for hours and hours and hours. So. So these are things that you have to have in your toolkit if you're working on that kind of project? Absolutely. You read the script and you realize you're dealing with extreme conditions of cold or water or abrasion, whatever. I mean, that somebody called me recently and said, Jeff, I have this movie that I'm going to be doing, and it's a love scene between a very aggressive love scene between these two characters, and the one character is covered in tattoos, and the director wants all those tattoos covered. So... There are ways to cover tattoos that are very proficient and very, very, uh, you know, perfect, so to speak, but they have a limit when it comes to their abuse. Oh, okay. So what, it can be hazardous to the person? or No, it, when it comes to their abuse in the way of abrasion. Right. If, uh, if two people are making hot, steamy, passionate love right. and there are tattoos covered up, sooner or later, that hot, the, steamy, passionate love is going to take those uncovered. tattoos right. off. Right. Okay. <laughs> Let's see. Tights has a question. Uh, who did he have more fun to put makeup on, The Rock or Arnold? You know what, both those guys are, are big kids. Mm -hmm. They're both very self-deprecating when it comes to themselves. They are humble, all right? And that says a lot for, for these big star actors. Well-accomplished athletes as very well. Very much so. They're both very confident and they're very comfortable in their own skin. So they both could be big kids. They both can be very professional. You know, if I needed to have Rock sit in the chair for three hours or Arnold sit in the chair for five hours, I remember when we did Terminator 3, I said, Arnold, are you prepared? I have a breakdown here that shows you in the makeup chair six hours a day. That's five hours in the morning. That's an, a half hour of touch-ups and a half hour of removal at the end of the day. And he said, Jeff, I'm getting paid a fortune. I don't give a shit. <laughs> and that was great for me as a makeup artist to hear that. Uh -huh. And he knows that I'm going to be as, as, as efficient right. and as prepared as possible. Now, did he ever take a break and say, I'll be back? 
<laughs> I'm sorry. Good I'm question. Sorry. <laughs> yes, yes, he did actually, and we would all laugh. You know, right. it's like no. ah, no, no. no on, on Terminator <laughs> One, were you ever saying to yourself, "No, nah, this guy, he he's going to be a governor someday"? I, I got my feeling about that. <laughs> I certainly wasn't saying that at the time, and it's funny because a few years ago we started jokingly calling him governor. Okay, this was when he was the president's counsel in physical fitness under under the original George Bush. And um, he was very much into politics. He loved politics at the time, and he was very smart about it. He was surrounded by the Kennedy clan. But when it comes to politicians, it doesn't matter if you're Democrat or Republican, they all love to just talk politics. Mm -hmm. And Arnold was very much a liberal um, Republican. Mm -hmm. So he got along great with, with them. And we would joke around, hey, governor, where's the governor? Well, little did we know. <laughs> <laughs> That's fun. Let's get to another I am here if we can. Let's see. No itching love. What project have you seen that you watched and thought that could have been done better? That's hard. Can you, if you're not that, comfortable. That's hard. You, yeah. you know what? There, there are, for the, the best answer to that is every film I've ever done. Right. There you go. Okay. Ooh, was, there, I should be a politician. That's right. Um, the, which is, there's a truth to that. Uh -huh. Every director, every craftsperson, every above and below the line person says that about the makeup. I have to do a makeup many times over many days before I go, I don't think I can improve that. But at the end of a film, I could have improved everything a little bit. I think every director and everybody says the same thing. Okay, fair enough. Another question from the Gillinator. Gillinator will ask any question you send in now because we like your name. <laughs> the Gillinator. Uh, she would like to know that, or he, uh, yeah, Gillinator, it's got to be she, right? Anyway, assuming that they don't change the law and Arnold can't run for president, what movie would you like to make with him after he's done being governor? And I added the part about changing the law and president thing. She didn't say that. Okay. <laughs> um, there are several movies out there that the Arnold fans, okay, from the Arnold fans website, which is a fantastic website that I've been part of for quite a while, um, come up over and over. Uh, there was um, uh, Doc Savage was one that he was going to do. There is um, there was going to be Westworld, a remake of Westworld that Arnold was very excited about. Of course, Crusade was a movie that we were prepping mm -hmm. for years, and finally, uh, Coralco Pictures filed Chapter Eleven, and it went away. Um, other Terminator films, um, uh, True this Lies Two. This, this isn't about Arnold. This isn't about. This is about what you would want. What I would what want. Would you, I would. You're large and in charge. Okay. Now. I would love to do King Conan. King Conan was on the fast track, mm -hmm. and John Milius, who wrote and directed the first Conan, was going to direct it. And I'd worked with John Milius on Flight of the Intruder. Fantastic guy, incredibly passionate, uh, talented guy, and. That was on the fast track to, to happening. It was going to be an older Arnold. It wasn't going to be the 25-year-old Arnold. It was going to be the 50-year-old Arnold at the time, or 55-year-old Arnold. And I was really excited about that. So that was one that I'll be always wishing that we did. Oh, nice. Well, I hope Bruce Willis will keep you working. So <laughs> We'll see. This is the first time I've worked with Bruce, so oh, we'll see how well, that goes. Well, good luck. We have some more stills that you brought in, so um, let's take a look at some of those. Here you are. Good-looking man. <laughs> You're talking about the guy on the right. Yes, no. <laughs> yes. Um, this, is, uh, this is me a couple of years ago in Prague in the Czech Republic doing a makeup test on Tanoi Reed, who is The Rock's photo double, who also looks a lot like The Rock. And here's an example of experimenting with, with uh, the double to save time and aggravation. And we went back and forth a few times, filmed it. Um, and finally dialed it into the right look. This is uh, my first movie with The Rock, uh, The Scorpion King. He had a very long wig and lots of sand. This is the after effect of being beaten up in the movie um, Walking Tall with some stitches and some uh, gelatin appliances. This is what he looked like the night before after wow. being beaten up <laughs> and uh, rolling around in the mud. Now, how do, you, how do you actually get the eye? Do you put a dye in the eye or is that a contact thing? That's a contact. As makeup artists, we also deal with teeth. We deal with lenses. Um, we don't put the lenses in. We bring in a, a technician that is specialized in that because you're dealing with being able to shut down the film if somebody gets a scratch or an infection. So you bring an expert in and have them do it. Now, you mentioned before with the makeup artist, maybe the actor requesting them, having worked on so many Arnold films and so many rock films now, is it because they requested you or, or someone else who does all their movies in production continues to use you? Well, it, it reached a point with Arnold, because I'd worked with him for 19 films over 19 years, that 
they wouldn't even go to Arnold's contract. Right. They would just say, okay, call Jeff Don. Mm -hmm. um, so that was certainly the effect there. Most of the time was with makeup artists and hairdressers that work with the star, they are in their contract. Mm -hmm. So when the big contract arrives, it says, you know, I want blue M&Ms in my trailer only, there's a provision there for makeup and hair. And sometimes it'll say, makeup artist of choice. It won't even have a name. But, you know, when you're dealing with a $20 million actor, they just say, no problem. And luckily, with my credits, I could go in and, and not be forced upon anybody. Right. It's not like, yes. yeah, they're not slow, right? <laughs> right. Yes. So, like, for instance, Batman and Robin in particular, that's one movie where you just did his makeup. Is that correct? Yes. On Batman and Robin, um, Arnold was hired to play Mr. Freeze. Mm -hmm. Joel Schumacher, the director of that Batman and the one previous to that, had always used V. Neal, who is a three-time Academy Award-winning makeup artist. And V and I have known each other for many years and get along very well. Well, Arnold wanted me to do his makeup. So I was brought in and I designed it and did all the tests. Another example of endless tests on doubles until we finally came up with the final look. And at the end of the day, the Mr. Freeze makeup included 11 people. There was lens technicians. There was first unit. There was second unit. There were people doing doubles. They were all people under my group so the star makeup artist that i was on that film ended up running a department of 11 people on two units wow <laughs> that's great for the love what does that say for the love fan the love fan cj as good as mine okay wants to know let's see do you have a favorite female artist that you would like to paint up angelina jolie Please say Angelina Jolie. <laughs> yeah, I, me too. Please say absolutely. Angelina Jolie. <laughs> I, I just watched Beowulf the other night, and I'd never been so turned on by a cartoon. Uh -huh. <laughs> Here's Angelina Jolie walking out naked with this gold stuff dripping off of her. I think, okay, calm down, Jeff. Um, Angelina Jolie is certainly gorgeous. It would be wonderful to do her makeup. Um, I, I love um, um, uh, um, Diane Lane. I find uh, you know the, the, the women that are getting older, mm -hmm that look fantastic. Yes, it's great you look at a Jessica Alba or or somebody like this and go, whoa, that looks hot. To me, and and I know from talking with a lot of guys in the trailer, I'm not the only kook out there that right. loves women 40 and older right. that look really great for their age. So, right. you know, find me a good looking woman that's 40 and over and put her in my chair. So do you look for, do facial features attract you then? Not necessarily aesthetic beauty as the average person may define it, but just, do you, are you looking at facial features, skin texture? Is that what turns absolutely, you on? Absolutely, you know, absolutely. Who so, turns you know, me on? What, make, you know, what do I drool over at night? Eyebrows. <laughs> um, many times an actress will walk in the trailer and she will have no makeup on. And you look at them and sometimes you go, whoa, there's one that makes a big difference when you put makeup on. And you know that you have to build them from scratch, that they'll become a gorgeous beauty once you spend two hours in the makeup and hair trailer. Other ones walk in and you think, you know what, I could throw mud on that face and she would look fantastic. Right. So, you know, it's, some of them are more challenging and you want to tackle that. Other ones you want to just rub a dry sponge on their face and then take all the credit for making them look gorgeous. There you go. <laughs> well, our lovely segment producer Jennifer May has a question for you. Jennifer? Yes. Hi, I do, I do. Thanks for being here. Um, I wanted to know what your biggest challenge is as a makeup artist and also what has been your biggest challenge working with an actor? Working with... With, with an actor or actors in particular? With an actor, you know what, luckily when you work with actors and actresses, they treat you generally very well because sometimes actors and actresses don't have a lot of allies mm -hmm. on a film. They're not comfortable talking with everybody. They, they, you know, they're private, they're personal. And suddenly here's somebody in their space touching them, talking to them, everything from there. They know your smell. Mm -hmm. And so they're going to treat you pretty well generally. So, are, are you in like the hairdresser, like the the bartenders of the set? They they tell you their problems. You know, they tell you what's going very on? much so, very much so. And it's you know, it's a it, that is true. We learn a lot about the actors and actresses that work with us. But there is a professional. You can say, well, if you talk, then you're not going to work anymore. I don't look at it that way. Okay, I could go to the Enquirer and make more money probably than I will the rest of my life and my career. It's just not my nature to do that. So. When you have a reputation of taking in all the information and not letting it out, people trust you. If you don't tell anybody, people know that, whether well, it's your friends or your family or the people you're working with. Now, you gave kudos a few minutes ago to Arnold Schwarzenegger when you were talking about, Arnold, you're going to have to sit in the chair for six hours. And he says, I make a lot of money. You can, right? Yes. So do you have actors who give you attitude when you tell them how long? 
they're going to have to sit in the chair. And is that ever a problem? It, Again, it, it I, can I be a problem. Absolutely. But, but it can be a problem. And, and you know, actors are, are not always the most patient people. Mm -hmm. And hopefully if a person signs up for a film that's extensive makeup, if a Jim Carrey signs up for a Grinch, he's not going to expect to get in and out of the makeup chair in 10 minutes. Okay. He knows the brutality of that. So, and then I will sit down with an actor or an actress and say, all right, you know what, when we go to this look next week, I'm going to need you in the chair for two hours. And usually it's not a surprise. And, uh, you know, they're usually pretty good about it. Um, if it's two hours and ten minutes, they're like, uh, excuse me. So it's a bit of a battle back and forth. Some actors just do not want to sit in the chair. And certain ones will sit in the chair for two hours for hair and want to sit in the chair for ten minutes for makeup and vice versa. Okay. Well, ladies and gentlemen, he is not only the founder of the Stream.TV, he is also executive producer of Film Nut. Brian Grimo, you got something to add? Yeah, I get to ask one question. Um, so, of course, they're trying to cater to indie filmmakers. Uh, when you're uh, Obviously, you see a low-budget film every once in a while. Is there something that when you're watching a, a low-budget indie film and you just think to yourself, man, if they only did this simple, cheap little thing, or maybe there's a recommendation you have for someone that, uh, hey, guys, before you go, if you, you know, even if you don't have a makeup artist, here, here's something simple or here's a couple of things that you can do that, that would actually make the shot look that much better. Um, I, I do think that from time to time when I, when I watch films. Um, as a makeup department head, I'm always critiquing how other people do it. Do they do it successfully? Do they do it believably? And uh, you know what? There is really no trick that I can just give right now on use more blood or less blood or more powder or less powder or don't use such red lipstick. Um, the, the truth of it is that the reality of what we're creating many times, whether it be uh, violence or, or skin conditions or whatever, the reality of it is unbelievable. Mm -hmm. We all look at these books on forensic pathology and, and dermatology and such, and the stuff that you see in there would not be believable or palatable on camera. So we have to take the believability factor and pull it back down so it's what people think it should look like. Right. And hopefully, in some instances, filmmaking has gotten inexpensive enough, I mean, I know some people are really working with nothing, that you can test shoot. You know, I mean, uh, what, what have you been talking about, you know, for a lot of the interview? You know, you're doing tests and you're working with different, you know, doubles and so forth to test the look. So even on your moderate, low budget scale, you, you can, there's time to test some things out, right? Absolutely. You want to test it when it's at least expensive. I mean, you've been doing it for years, your third generation, and you don't do it for like the first time on camera go. Right? Absolutely you, you, you not. Still, you it, still do it, tests, absolutely. right? And then a lot of times I'll do tests that nobody sees but myself. Right. Because I have questions in what I want to do. Right. I don't want to present this to the director. I don't want to present it to the actor. So I'll do tests maybe on my arm. I might be sitting there doing a prosthetic where I'm stitching up something on my leg, and then I'll take pictures of it and go, hmm, okay. I'm now going to do this test for the director, right. and then I'll do it for the actor. And then maybe in a couple of weeks, we'll actually put it on camera and we'll test it. Right. And then we'll actually film it in three weeks. Yeah, no, so that's great. So that's very important. Let's see. Hi, Jeff. Hey, hey, from Sweden is watching. There you go. <laughs> yeah, Sweden. <laughs> we like Sweden. <laughs> and let's see. Happy hour, would like to ask. How much of a movie's budget is dedicated to hair and makeup? Is it, is it a percentage of the overall budget? Or does it vary based on the needs of a specific picture? Some movies might have a, a absolutely. Um, depending on the film, you might have a five million dollar film that a million dollars of it is makeup, mm -hmm. because it's a uh, 28 days later or mm -hmm. something like that, where it's very very important. I find that the films that I do typically vary between about five hundred thousand and about a million dollars for the makeup and hair mm -hmm. budget. And, and that's the, inclusive. The, the overall budgets of the movies you work on, just to give well, those, it a perspective. Okay, that's a good. Uh, absolutely. Um, Typically, it might be in the 50 to $100 million range. Okay. That is a very broad range. Sure. It could be a $100 million film that is $400,000 in makeup. You can see it's not a huge portion. Um, many times a film will have 20 or $30 million in visual effects, several million dollars in transportation and picture cars, special effects. Um, you know, if it's a period film, Every department is expensive because you're building your props and your wardrobe and your castles and, and your hair goods and all of those things. So it, it varies. I would imagine on, on, on the 13th Warrior, which is a Vikings picture that John McTiernan directed, that was originally called Eaters of the Dead from a book of Michael Crichton, it was a $2 million makeup budget on it because there was a lot of special effects and I had over a thousand people working on that throughout the film. It was similar to that on the on uh, Scorpion King, another big budget 
film. So that, that's an example. Okay. So getting back to something I may have cut you off on before, what would you say is the most difficult part of what you do? What I do, you know, it's you're constantly balancing as, as a, not as a makeup artist so much, but as a department head. Mm -hmm. It's my responsibility to keep my crew safe and happy and um, rotated and, 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 you know, feeling passionate and excited and informed about their job. It's my responsibility to keep the director happy that what's on camera is what he wants. It's my job to keep the budget in check and keep the producers happy, not to mention keeping the actors and actresses happy. So you're playing, you know, you're, you've got a big daycare with a lot of kids. Right. And some of them are going to want to cry and some of them are going to poop in their pants and some of them are going to want to eat. And, you know, you're dealing with a lot of kids in a lot of ways that are artistic, very intelligent, driven, successful, oftentimes wealthy people. So it's a fine line, but I love that aspect of it. I love the responsibility and the potential of catastrophic disaster. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so on a 50 to $100 million budget feature, how mm -hmm. many people are working in your department underneath you? Um, typically a makeup department can be as, as, makeup and hair department can be as few as about four people or as many as 100. And I just finished a film. I got back from Shreveport, Louisiana a couple of days ago, and I was on a film that had about seven or eight makeup and hair people on it on a daily basis. Um, a movie like uh, uh, The Scorpion King, I hired 115 people and sometimes had makeup and hair going on in seven different trailers or tents or locations simultaneously. Hmm. So it varies a great deal. Now, are you applying makeup as well? Yes. I have to be careful when I'm department heading a film that I don't get bogged down. And as much as I love all the, the aspects of makeup, I will find specific characters, hopefully that don't work a lot of days, but are very interesting in their, in, in their design and their, 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 their character look, and try to grab a hold of those. As the department head, I can pick and choose who right. gets whom. Right. But uh, you have to be careful because if you, f if you fill s your chair for those two or three hours in the morning with characters, you don't, you know, you're, you're the lifeguard that's looking down at their book. You're not looking at the, the beach in front of you. Okay, we have some more effects, pictures to look at, and then we have a question from one of our regular 71 Rencon that I really like that we'll get to after we look at some of these pictures. What are we looking at? This is a test makeup from on one of our beauties from um, uh, 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 Scorpion King. We had all these women and men running around with various mud in their face and hair and bodies. That's this is the before picture of the photo double that we saw earlier uh, that has the prosthetic on later on. Right here he does not have the prosthetic on. Just a, a fan from uh, the movie uh, 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 Game Plan. Uh, I seem to be doing a lot of football films lately. <laughs> and uh, you, know, you start looking for things that you can make up. And, oh, you, come on over here. I'll make you a fan. This is actually a woman that was in one of my son, Patrick's, uh, films. And she was a, a, a meth addict and those very bumps, far along. Those bumps on her arms? Is that These you? Are, this is all me. Um, this was about an hour's worth of makeup. Um, this was after researching meth addicts, and it's a pretty brutal thing. You can go to facesofmeth.com and see some horrific faces of what people look like. Um, an example of some of the characters from the movie Be Cool. This is uh, myself and a couple crew members along with The Rock in, um, on uh, the movie Doom in uh, uh, Czech Republic. This is a test makeup uh, and hair of the rock. He had a wig on here. The wig wasn't exactly attached. You might be able to see the actual hair lace on the wig that hasn't been glued down yet, which we would do later on, and it's a fake beard. This is an example of my latest makeup trailer. I also design and build makeup trailers. This particular one is on uh, the show Desperate Housewives oh, right now. Very nice. Now, is a straight drama with nothing funky going on, is that like boring easy work for you yeah, it's very boring easy work for me and it, i wouldn't say easy because easy you think of easy as being a good word right you know it's like uh, I, I don't i don't like the word easy when it comes to makeup i like a lot of challenge a lot of potential for success and failure and i like to keep busy the whole time and that usually means action or futuristic or period type films sounds good well let's get to that i am i was alluding to from 71 rencon do you think too often makeup and special effects are just covering up bad writing absolutely i do there um, you go <laughs> absolutely unfortunately you can read a script and maybe it's a, a five on a scale of one to ten mm -hmm. and what the 
what the filmmakers are hoping for is the great cinematography and acting and makeup and props and wardrobe and explosions is going to turn that five into an eight and they're going to make millions of dollars. That usually doesn't happen. You know, if, if, if a film succeeds, oftentimes it's because of its great story mm -hmm. along with its great direction and cinematography and editing and makeup and all of those other things. Those other aspects only affect the overall success of a film so much. It all comes down to the script. Yeah, I think it's terrible. Never never settle. Make the best script possible and then let those other things enhance it. Absolutely. But don't count on it to, to make it. Right? Absolutely. Yeah. We see it all the time. You go to the video store yeah. and how come I never heard of that big film? And then right. you watch it right. and you see the big actors in it and you see the big budget and the big name director and go, this is horrible. Yeah. Actually, now I'm to the point now where I see a really big film mm -hmm. and I'm like, I haven't heard of it. Uh, must be a reason, <laughs> you know, and I put it back. You well, know? Nowadays, it's great because I will literally be in the in the video store and I'll pull up my phone and go to IMDb or go to RottenTomatoes.com and I'll see where it's rated. If it's right. rated high and has good thumbs up on it, then okay, I'll give it a try. Good. Tom Hornborn wants to know, were you on the set in Talking Tall when The Rock got punked and it was his makeup trailer that exploded? I was there, and um, <laughs> it wasn't his makeup trailer. It was his uh, actual uh, trailer that he was you know, dressing and changing in. And the producers came to us because we in the makeup trailer needed to keep him in the trailer. We needed to be in on this so that they could switch out his trailer with one that was set with pyrotechnics. It was a very long, detailed uh, preparation for this, and it went down quite well. Those guys are good at that. Well, good. Our last instant message of the night. Hope it's a good one. <laughs> what is the worst disaster to happen on the set that you have fixed? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I, I immediately think of a time on Terminator 2 when I'm sitting down at lunch and my crew is on the set still. And the director, James Cameron, says, find out from Jeff Dawn how long it'll take to remove that light that's on Arnold's prosthetic because we want to do a shot from the side and we don't want to see the three-dimensional light sticking there. We'll replace it in rotoscope, which is a technique to, to do things like that later on in post. This is what I hear. I go, you know what? I can take it off in just a few minutes. The problem is I didn't get up and go to Jim and say, Jim, what do you need? You realize when we take it off, it stays off for the day. So in the, in the communication back and forth between ADs and, 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 and the, 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 the walkie-talkies and such, I assumed. Assumption is the mother of all foul-ups. That's something that Jim will tell everybody. And I assumed that I knew what he was talking about. So we came back from lunch. I took off the light. We filmed the shot. All right, Dawn, put the light back on. Uh, Jim, uh, you're going to rotoscope it. What? You're going to tell me I have to do a $40,000 rotoscope shot because you don't want to put the light on? I'm like, oh, no. This is going horribly wrong in front of 100 people. Jim, I screwed up. I'm sorry. I assumed I... Took it upon myself to assume that we were in communication and I should have come to you. I need 30 minutes. I need this person and this person. I need a tall director's chair here and a light. I am very, very sorry. So when you prostate yourself like that in front of a director, they can only kill you so much. Right, right. And, uh, of course, the production sat there, you know, at thousands of dollars a minute waiting for me. And little things like that have happened throughout my career. But that was a pretty brutal one because you can't hide that screw up. It is in front of the world. You've screwed up, you've admitted it, and now you're fixing it in front of everybody. Right. It's like, all right, that'll never happen again. <laughs> and has it? Not like that. No. Okay. You know, you learn lessons in the film business. We're all very good at protecting our reputation, not looking like idiots too often. And um, so you learn as you go along. Okay, don't do that. Don't step in that mousetrap. You're gonna, you know, it's gonna hurt. Well, thank you, Tice, for that question. And since that was such a good one, we'll, we'll give one more question, one more shot. Yes. And let's see what we get here from Atlanta. Atlanta, like special effects getting boxed out by CGI, do you have jobs that get smaller due to CGI? Um, absolutely. The jobs that we were doing practically three-dimensionally on the set years ago are now being taken over slowly by CGI, where we would spend several hours maybe doing one cut of a shot that was a special effect or a prosthetic or an animatronic years ago, they don't want to wait. They don't want to have 100 crew members standing around waiting to get the shot right and not guaranteeing that it'll go right within the first 10 minutes or the first 10 hours. So many times they'll say, you know what, we'll do it in post. And the shot that may have cost 30 minutes and cost $10,000 to create an animatronic thing for it is now going to cost 
$200,000 to do in post later on, but nobody wants to wait. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's done better digitally, sometimes it isn't. So it's best to do things quickly, um, three-dimensionally, low-tech when it's going to look the best and to guarantee them that it's going to work. And you can do this through testing it and showing, look at, we did this yesterday, look how great it works. Okay, good. We'll set up uh, two hours tomorrow to do it. Fantastic. Jeff, you were incredibly informative. I hope you enjoyed coming on the show because it's been a lot of fun having you here. Now it is time for a quick bit of last looks. Jennifer May, guzzling some water. Anything to add? <laughs> I just want to say thanks for being here today. I okay. Very a lot welcome, Jennifer. How come you're not on camera? She's so beautiful. She is. Oh, you got some thank mug you like so me much. and right. some guy like you. Yeah. <laughs> and the thank beauty is in the much. other room. There you go. Brian Grimo, what do you know? Um, I know that um, we're, we, again, we, we, the show's supposed to be uh, 30 minutes, and uh, <laughs> I just, you know, I'm just letting them go over because I'm really just happy uh, learning so much, and thank you for coming. Good deal. We have no damage report tonight, so yeah, we got the time here for Film Nut. Well, thank you everyone, one and all, for tuning in. Thank you for the great questions, and look forward to seeing you back here next week. Huh?